Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Matt, and thanks very much to Greg and everyone else involved in organizing this wonderful uh, conference and for allowing me to be a part of it. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is primarily, is almost entirely related to a project that I've been working on for the last 12 years called the, the Chinese Text Project, ctext.org. I'm not going to try and give a comprehensive introduction to it, but instead I'm going to try and talk about some aspects of it which you can think of as some first steps towards building a type of infrastructure for handling certain issues with pre-modern Chinese texts. So what I will say first of all is that the Chinese Text Project is now uh, the largest full-text digital library of pre-modern Chinese. Uh, it has 25 million pages of scanned primary source materials, 5 billion characters of transcription, and it's used daily by a large number of people, uh, over 25,000. So if you've heard me talk about this uh, project several years ago, which some of you may have done, uh, the first thing to say is that it's now radically different uh, in terms of its uh, underpinnings and design to how it was uh, several years ago. So this relates to this rapid expansion in terms of content. Uh, in the initial stages, it was originally primarily a static database, uh, whereas since 2013, it's, it has major dynamic components. And what I mean by that, and I'll say more about it in a moment, is that it, whereas it was previously a centrally edited and maintained traditional database or full text database project, uh, it's now something which is primarily maintained by a crowdsourced user base. So thinking of ctext.org in terms of digital infrastructure, I think there are three main important components which work together to make it something which can be repurposed for other projects. And these are firstly optical character recognition designed specifically for these types of texts, secondly an integrated crowdsourcing system, and lastly a public open application programming interface. And these three things together can be used for a variety of use cases. Uh, it can be used for its original purpose, which was as a searchable database of full text information and primary source material, but it can also be used as a scalable transcription tool, a repository for data mining, and for other purposes too. So this change from static to dynamic is related in part to uh, a rapid pace of digitization, particularly in the sense of scanning. Uh, so scanning historical materials is relatively cheap. So when I say relatively, I'm thinking particularly relative to creating high quality proofread transcriptions of the content of these same things. Producing digital images of them is a relative, relatively speaking a mechanical process. It's well understood. The storage and processing costs related to it are continuing to decrease exponentially. And there are also other reasons why people want to produce these uh, scanned images. These are very useful for conservation of materials, where these are stored in libraries. They may be rare or unique objects. If scholars are working with images rather than the physical objects, uh, this reduces damage and risk to these objects. And partly as a result of these factors, uh, there are many large-scale scanning projects undertaken. One which I'm particularly familiar with is the Harvard Yenjing Library Rare Books Project, uh, where over 5 million pages of scanned primary source materials have been created using a high-quality digitization process. These are now all in ctext.org. Uh, but that's actually not even the largest scanning project. There are much larger ones ongoing in mainland China. So the static versus dynamic contrast that I'm trying to draw here um, is one between a sort of straight line workflow that corresponds quite closely to the traditional publishing model and the traditional way of creating full text databases of a certain type uh, and, a and a dynamic process, which uh, I'll mention in a moment. So the static process basically consists of steps that are performed one after another. First transcriptions are made, then these are corrected, punctuated, annotated, uh, often by expert editors. And then finally, once all these, these uh, processes have been completed and a review procedure has been undertaken, these are finally uh, set into their final form and ingested into what is essentially a static database. And at that point, they can be used by whoever the user base of the system is. The dynamic approach that I'm describing here consists of all of the same stages, but in a different order. So the first step is transcription, and in the case of the project I'm talking about today, that's primarily now by OCR. Uh, the second stage is then to immediately ingest this uh, initial material into a database system, or into some sort of system where it can immediately be used, and simultaneously be corrected, punctuated, and annotated. So all of the same, the same stages occur in both uh, these types of pipeline. The major difference which I want to draw attention to between these two is the section highlighted in yellow here during which the results of this procedure are unavailable to users. 
So this is significant because in the traditional or straightforward uh, publishing model, the highlighted section prior to where results are available to the users is slow and expensive. Uh, this relies on expert editors and manual work, whereas in the dynamic process, if we're talking about OCR for our transcription, for the initial transcription, then this is something which is fast and cheap. And this is not a trivial con contrast if we're talking about large volumes of materials, millions of pages, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of pages of material. Slow and expensive can really mean an enormous amount of investment in terms of money and also time scales where we're talking about decades rather than months or years. So this is related to, and I was very happy to see a similar slide in Greg's presentation yesterday, this idea of the long tail, where we have here plotted text and additions against popularity or frequency of use of these materials. And at the top end on the left hand side, you have the mainstream text and additions which are digitized very early on because they're seen as being so important and worthy of this investment. If you move further to the right of the graph, you'll see things that will um, win this sort of competition for funding and be tr transcribed carefully using this traditional approach over, say, the next 10 years. And the thing that I want to draw attention to is what's left over. Everything else, uh, the obscure and inaccessible editions, which will not make it into this uh, traditional model of digitization anytime in the near future. And so these are the ones that uh, can be addressed using some sort of dynamic model. Uh, they don't really fit into the traditional publishing model. Um, they need something which is more scalable. So now coming back to the specific project I'm talking about, um, this is a graph of database size uh, by year. Uh, and I've highlighted the point in 2013 when we changed from being a static system to a dynamic one. And you can actually see, if you look at this chart, initially it looks like we did absolutely nothing from 2005 to 2013. There's no change there at all that's visible in this chart. In fact, you can only see it if you switch to a log scale graph. And you'll see that actually, over those nine years, uh, we added um, we added several hundred texts, but this increase in content has been absolutely dwarfed by the subsequent increase to quickly thousands and tens of thousands of texts which are now included in the system. And so you might ask, well, are people actually using these uh, texts that are now available? Uh, and we have seen since then an exponential increase in uh, utilization of this system. Uh, another thing which we've seen since becoming a dynamic site is a rapid increase, particularly after changing to a newer editing interface, which I'll describe quickly uh, later on, in terms of contributions from our users. And, and I don't know whether you can see on the graph here, the scale here is up to uh, something like 40,000 contributions from users um, by sometime last year. So getting back to the technical things that underpin this, um, the first thing which makes this possible is domain-specific OCR. So this is OCR developed for the specific types of text that we're interested in including in this database, so pre-modern Chinese texts. Um, by doing that, we get to leverage domain knowledge, so things that are specific to the, the case that we're working on, rather than having to solve the general OCR problem. Uh, so we can leverage things like language and writing conventions. We can also make use of things like text reuse and the fact that many of the things we're digitizing are different editions of essentially the same thing. So this means, in theory, you have an easier problem, so we ought to be able to get more accurate results as compared with something like Google Books OCR, for instance. And if we can do this reasonably successfully, uh, the first thing this will allow us to do with this long tail of material is to enable image search, so we can search in our textual transcription to locate uh, information in these scanned images. Uh, and if we have reasonably good OCR, then we can also use this as a basis for creating transcriptions of those texts within the long tail, which we actually are interested in at a particular time. And the goal of this online system is that frequent use will lead to more opportunities for correction, and so that's where the crowdsourcing comes in, uh, and we hope to see that to correct many of our texts. So just to take a quick look at the OCR, um, this is a comparison. So on the left, we have Google Books scan of a particular page of material, and on the right, the Google Books OCR result for that same page. Um, you probably don't need to even know Chinese to be able to see that this is not a good transcription. Uh, you don't have, have even the right number of columns here. You have all sorts of things which are not Chinese and just do not plausibly occur in this type of material. Um, I'm mainly mentioning this because we can actually make a fair comparison with the OCR procedure used on CTEX because this exact same page is included in CTEX. Uh, and the transcription on the right here is the raw OCR 
output that we get from our current procedure. So this is prior to any editing. Uh, there's been no manual noise removal from that. So there's still mistakes there. It's not a perfect transcription, um, but it's a very big improvement. So one of the big advantages of this dynamic approach is that imperfect data can still be useful. Um, so OCR-derived text enables full text search. Uh, it also enables initial transcriptions. Uh, these are all examples from the Harvard Yenjing uh, rare books collection now. Another thing that we can do taking advantage of text reuse is to match scan material using OCR to existing transcriptions which you al already have for uh, the same text, either for the same edition or very closely related edition. And there are various advantages to doing this. Um, the result effectively gives us the same type of data that we could have got from raw OCR with the advantage that we don't introduce any errors of transcription due to OCR. So all, the, all that we get from the OCR is the alignment with the specific scanned edition. And this data is data which is useful for us to have because it allows us to confirm the accuracy of any part of our transcription uh, by locating it and manually reviewing the uh, scanned material. So behind this, as you probably expect, uh, this is a crowdsourced system. It's open to anyone on the internet who can go and create an account. Our goal is to get as many people as possible helping us uh, correct this material. So we borrow various ideas from projects like Wikipedia. Uh, first of all, we have an edit log recording who made what changes to what text at what time. Uh, we version all of these texts. This is linked to a diff view, which shows precisely what was changed in a particular edit. So on the left here, we have uh, this one, one line, which does actually mean one in Chinese being erased and being replaced with this green three on the right. It just characterizes what happened at this particular time. And the, the point with this where we're actually better off than Wikipedia is that we can directly link from this diff view to the scanned and transcribed side-by-side -side representations with the precise location where this change happened highlighted uh, in our textual view. So it makes it very clear, uh, very easy to authenticate whether a particular edit uh, was indeed a valid correction. So we have a three here. We just look on the left to see in the corresponding position, is that or is that not what occurs in our scan? Another uh, thing that we really need to make this kind of thing happen behind the scenes is some sort of human readable, or I put that in inverted commas, serialization of the state of the text at any particular time, because we need to be able to diff these and visualize the changes between different versions. So what I've put here first on this uh, slide is what the actual serialization used at the moment look like, looks like. It's basically a fairly ugly XML fragment. Um, the important thing and the change that I mentioned earlier on with the change to an improved editing interface is that now people typically, 99% of the time, do not edit this representation themselves directly. Instead, they use a, a type of visual editor, which visualizes the XML, it transforms it into a form which is much more easily editable uh, by a human being. So specifically, it transforms it into a simple editable piece of text where each row represents a column in the scanned image. Uh, line breaks represent the change from one uh, column to the next. So what this means is that our users can use this uh, intuitive editor to edit the underlying representation without having to interact with it directly. So in changing from being just a static um, database to be more of a platform, to be something which can be repurposed for different uh, purposes, um, one of the most important additions, apart from this crowdsourcing uh, aspect in the OCR, is the addition of an API which allows access to full text data and metadata about these materials. And what this means is that uh, users can basically control the entire process. They can upload their textual data, they can upload scanned image data, uh, they can correct the OCR results themselves or in collaboration with other people, and then at the end of the day they can also download their transcription uh, via the API. And the benefit of doing this through this kind of system is that the time and effort which individual people invest in making these corrections is pooled and preserved so that their corrections as a side effect become part of the public database and become available to other people who want to search these texts or who want to download the full text content for these texts. Um, I think it's interesting to note that there are some psychological factors that I don't have any particular data for this, but my uh, observations from this uh, dramatic change in 2013 is that there's an interesting um, psychological contrast between creating new content from scratch 
versus correcting incorrect, incorrect content which is already there. So in some cases, we've had individual users basically correct an entire text from a relatively poor OCR scan. Uh, this has happened much more frequently than prior to having this interactive system. We had individuals actually submit their own complete transcription of any text. Um, that's probably related in part to the contrast between an un unpredictable response if you're talking about contacting somebody either through a discussion forum or by email to say, I've got this great transcription of this text, can you use it, versus having an interactive system that you just click and submit and immediately see uh, your correction has been accepted and made available to everyone. And that's also related to uh, this idea of incremental improvement versus having to do everything or nothing. Um, I put this here as an, as an example. This is quite a nice example because this is a page of text uh, which would basically be impossible to OCR accurately um, because it is essentially a character dictionary of obscure characters. So these are characters where if you had a billion characters of Chinese, you might have one or two of these in your entire corpus. For most OCR technologies that are in, in use at the moment, that, that's not really the type of problem which uh, they would be able to solve. For this specific example, we did actually have relatively poor OCR results for this, and CTEX users have crowdsourced the corrections to, uh, to a very high standard. Um, we have, so one thing that's being developed at the moment are task-specific visual editing tools to aid in the process. Uh, so one problem we have for Chinese in particular is characters which don't exist in Unicode. Uh, so we have this kind of visual editing tool where users can select regions of the image which correspond to a particular character. It's then automatically extracted, and a user inputs various types of metadata describing this character. And what they get at the end of this process is an XML representation of the data that they filled in. And then this can be just be added into the uh, textual transcription of this particular page. The advantage of doing it like this is that we then get machine-readable data, which we can aggregate for these rare non-unicode characters to say, well, where in the corpus does the same character appear? Uh, and we can use that to um, make possible the interpretation of these texts. OK, so the last of the things that I wanted to talk about was the API for this uh, system. So this is also composed of three main components. The first are uh, universal resource names, which just provide unique identifiers for various textual objects in the system. Secondly, a fairly conventional JSON API, which makes it possible to programmatically extract machine-readable data, textual data, metadata, and so on. And lastly, a plugin system which is designed to allow people to extend the user interface of ctext.org in various ways, primarily to link it to other projects, particularly online projects. And these plugins are designed to be user-definable, share shareable, automatically updated, and completely distributed. So these don't require any sort of permission to uh, set one up or uh, share it with other users. They're also designed to be usable by people who have no particular technical knowledge. So they they are composed of, they are XML documents, uh, but users who want to install them and use them don't actually have to interact with the XML representation. So there's point and click installation from within the, the project, but also from third party websites. For example, the Marcus Textual Markup Platform has a, a CTEX plugin that you can install it from it. So this is all decentralized and doesn't require prior coordination. What the plugins look like in practice is something like this. So these are examples highlighted in red here of dictionary plugins. So each link in this highlighted section corresponds to one particular plugin that this user happens to have installed in their account. And each one of these, if you click on it, will link you to some external dictionary resource. The idea is it opens the same entry in any of these other dictionaries. And so, of course, the point here is not that I've given everyone a big list of all of the Chinese dictionaries that are online. The point is that you can define this for any dictionary that you like for a new dictionary. Uh, you can also use it to link to resources like this one, which are behind uh, paywalls, publisher paywalls. If you have access to that dictionary and it's important for your work, then you can install the plugin. The rest of the community who don't have access to it don't need to see this. Uh, the idea, the next idea is to have textual plugins, which are basically the same thing and the same idea expanded to textual objects. The most simple of these is a plain text export function. Um, so I mention this in particular because the plain text export function is not really part of ctext anymore. It's actually an external plugin, which means you can download it, modify the code, and make it do whatever you want to. Um, so for example, if you didn't want this as plain text, if you wanted this as a simple TEI document, you could just download the code, modify it, and create your own plugin to do that. 
uh, you can basically do anything which you can do with textual uh, data. So you can do word clouds, uh, frequency comparisons, and you can also link to uh, entirely different tools like the Marcus <coughs> textual markup platform, which does named entity uh, identification on Chinese texts. The very last thing I want to talk about is the use of this API in digital humanities teaching. This, so one of the nice things about APIs is that this was not actually the original use case for it. It wasn't developed with this in mind. Um, but it turns out that having access to textual data through a single unified mechanism, uh, which is consistent and produces data always in the same format, is something which is very useful if you want to do uh, digital humanities teaching where you're teaching introductory programming to students from a humanities background. So this is just a very simple example Python program. Um, here there are basically only two lines that have anything to do with the ctext API. We have one line which imports our Python module to access the ctext API and then the second line simply gets a textual object in a particular format into Python variables in the requested way. So in this case it's very simply getting a textual object as a string and then performing regular expressions on it. The advantage for this in teaching is basically all of the things that you don't see in this program and all of the things that you don't need as additional instructions for how to use this program. Um, so we don't have to cover when we're just getting started, when we're trying to learn what regular expressions are, um, things like fully qualified path names, how you load a file in, how you uh, segment it into chunks, how you perform cleanup on your initial textual data. And we also don't need to work with toy examples. You can trivially change this example to work with any of the 30,000 texts in ctext or any of the other hundreds of thousands of textual objects. Uh, you can also get the data in different formats simply using a fairly intuitive function. So you can get it, get the data uh, in a list format. For example, if you need a list of paragraphs, you can do that easily through the API because it provides data always in a consistent form. So this is just a simple example producing a simple network graph of social relationships in the analytes. Again, one of the nice things about these things is that if you change the URN, this will produce the expected result with any other textual object. And this uh, can be <coughs> expanded to much more sophisticated examples, so you won't be able to see the details of the code here. Um, this is a fairly short program which performs principal component analysis for authorship attribution on vectors extracted from four different texts in uh, the Chinese Text Project database where the text is being extracted, this time uh, not as a string and not as paragraphs, but in individual chapters of the text. And one of the nice things about this is that we can also extract the uh, metadata along with the text. So at the top right here, uh, the legend actually includes the text titles and the authors for comparison. So in this particular example, uh, the idea is that these orange dots are supposed to be uh, qualitatively different to the dots corresponding to these other three works by a different author. And again, the nice thing about this program is that it can be trivially rerun. Simply, even you don't have to look at the code, you only have to look at the very first line, which lists the four textual identifiers. If you change these to four other identifiers, you'll get the exact result you would expect. So, um, main conclusion, OCR and crowdsourcing are one way to uh, allow access to some of the information in the long tail of texts, obscure texts which would otherwise uh, may not have any access to. Infrastructure helps users help themselves, and as a side effect, they actually help the community. Uh, API access allows use in a variety of different workflows, including workflows for which it may not have been originally designed. Uh, in digital humanities teaching, having access to textual data in a consistent format through an easy mechanism like this avoids the dilemma of choosing between toy examples or providing students with specific examples that are going to work versus uh, teaching them, first of all, data wrangling before you can get started with interesting stuff. Instead, they can, from the very first class, uh, apply this to whatever examples are interesting to their own research. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say for now. Um, all of this, all, everything I've described is publicly available on ctext.org. And um, even if you don't speak Chinese, a lot of the information there, all of the sort of introductory explanation and most of the user interfaces in English. Uh, it's designed such that you should be able to use it even if you don't speak much Chinese. And there's also practical introduction available to this address if you're interested. Thank you. Okay, questions? We have seven minutes until lunch, so uh, I don't want to
bunch. So, questions? Thank you for this very interesting talk. And um, this correction for this tracks to be as practical, but it, it's also the essence of, of textual criticism to take a text and uh, try to correct it where, where it's mistaken. And um, I presume that the intention texts are, they, they, they survive in problematic forms. And what we do with one user uh, proposes one correction or one correction and another user and another. Right, yeah, so that's certainly a problem. Um, it's not necessarily a problem with all of these texts, but particularly the earliest ones. Um, really, the the goal of the site, even before the, the, the big changes in 2013, has always been to assemble primary source evidence in a way that's useful. So in terms of this transcription procedure uh, on C-Text, every transcription is based on one specific edition of one specific text. And the goal there is to, once multiple editions of the same text have been uh, created and uh, proofread to a high standard of accuracy, then we can start using automated procedures to compare these usefully to provide us with another better way of navigating the primary source evidence. So I guess, I mean, that doesn't totally answer your question because there's still a question of, well, if you want to emend this particular edition to something else. Um, basically, the, basically, what we require is for individual users who want to make emendations to cite specifically within, within C-Text other verifiable evidence for making that emendation. So it's basically a question of starting a discussion as to why we want to amend it this way and why we want to amend it another way. That was just fantastic. And I was also there when it was static. I saw it three years ago, and the progress is just incredible. Uh, so uh, you should amend it for that. I have a question, though, about the right status for the underlying data. Uh, because it seems to me, I, I was kind of looking through the FAQ, it's, it's all, it's not CC or open source, that, uh, open access that I can tell. But everything you're doing, <laughs> like all the tool development, all the crowdsourcing, the API control, it's, it's leaning in that direction. So I'm just curious where that stands. Because, and I'll say I have an agenda here. Uh, with working, with, <laughs> working with the classical language toolkit, we're doing a lot of the same things in other languages. I'd, I'd love to just, you know, be able to work with, with that data as well and develop tools alongside. Uh, so, uh, yeah, where, where's, where's the project right to us? Um, unfortunately, I don't really have a great answer to that at the moment. Um, <laughs> there's a kind of tension between wanting to make as much as possible open source and hoping that as many people as possible will actually correct these things rather than simply download them, correct their own copy, and work with that. Um, but that's something we need to look at more in the future. So wait, what is this the right status then of the stuff? If I go, if someone comes in and corrects something, uh, that text, is that open text or is that, who is the, where is the rights for that text? Um, well, in terms of, what, in terms of the user policy for what users agree to if they submit corrections, yeah. they, they agree to, to um, hand their copyright over to ctext.org. And if there is any copyright in their emendation, there because in reality, a lot of this is basically public domain. So again, if it's just transcription, there's no creativity, there's no basis right. for copyright. Right, right, right. So how much, question, how much of this stuff, how many of these texts are restricted because somebody else has rights? How many of those things do you put a copyright on is the question. Um, there should not be anything in here of which other people have rights to. Um, if anyone uploads something like that and it's identified, then it should be removed. So, so I think part of the reason for preserving the rights and asking people to sign them over is that that's the only way that it can then be released under a Creative Commons yeah. license. So, I mean, what's the then are you releasing it under? So, what's the status of the CC license? Um, ambiguous at the moment. <laughs> okay, it 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 feels terrible before you do it, and then it's like very liberating. But this is also <laughs> a problem with things like Rosea, uh, it's all great, but it's, it's a website. You can't. It's not been CC licensed, uh, and if it is, if it isn't, what are you going to do with it? Look, don't touch. That's something we haven't really talked a lot about. So it's a real, uh, you know, it's a real thing. Uh, in visual, you know, the people I work with bullied me into a CC license more than ten years ago, uh, and uh, we went with it, and it actually was great uh, in terms of. Of, in every respect, but it's a real decision. 